As I'm sure you know, civilization was born when people quit hunting and gathering and instead began eating from their poo. Today we call this gardening. Since we are omnivores, our precious poo boasts among the densest concentrations of nutrients in the natural world. People be proud of your poo, for your poo proved to be the best fertilizer until the 19th century. People's poo production yields gave us the great poo breakthrough, the birth of agriculture. As hunter-gatherers set up camps along rivers and started farming in their poo, their camps grew into towns, and these towns then made alliances or conquered the other little towns along the river. And soon, all these allied towns were trading all kinds of resources and information up and down the river, and over time, they became culturally fused together. As they farmed and fused, their resources and safety grew, and more of their children survived until the towns grew into little cities. The strings of little cities forming little civilizations which worked out the first forms of currency. Many people believe the first economies, the pre-poo economies, relied on bartering, but there is actually no evidence of a society or economy that relied primarily on barter. That is a myth. Instead, pre-monetary societies operated largely along the principles of gift economy and debt. So basically IOUs, debt economies based on trust. I am sworn to carry your burdens. When barter did occur, it was usually between complete strangers because strangers are potential enemies and you can't really trust them to pay you back. Regardless, the new poo-based economies soon transitioned from a trust-backed standard to a barley-backed standard. With barley, one could make bread and beer. With bread and beer, bad decisions are made and babies are born. Every baby has a brain and more babies means more brain power, innovating and creating. Soon bronze becomes a thing, the bronze plow increase barley yields which means more bread and beer and babies and bad decisions and soon Babylon is born. And here, in Babylon, the first currency emerged the shekel, backed by the barley standard. One shekel was equal to 160 grains of barley. Fast forward several centuries and Babylon was now part of the Persian Empire, and between the Persian Empire and the Greek city-states, there was a little kingdom called Lydia in what is now Turkey. See, look at where Lydia is located. This is probably the most interesting place to be in most of human history because this is the bridge between the west and east. Throughout history, every kingdom here, including the Kingdom of Lydia, operated as a sort of middleman along the Silk Road between the East and the West, between Europe and Asia, Islam and Christianity, and in the case of Lydia, between the Hellenistic and Persian worlds. Well, the Persians and the Greeks did not use the same currency, nor did they have much else in common except for three things mutual hate for each other, much trade with the Lydians, and a motivational appreciation of gold. You see, gold has always been valuable for religious reasons, since it doesn't corrode, it lasts forever, and it looks cool, kind of like the sun. Well, not really, the sun is white, but sunrises and sunsets are golden, and since the sun brings life and grows crops and chases off the winter, which is death, most gods and most religions were based on the sun the son of God, and so gold was valuable because people wanted to mold it into little statues and trinkets and stuff and put it in their temples, and maybe, just maybe, if they prayed hard enough to that gold, then God, the life-giving son, would bless them with good crops and good luck to fend off raiders and getting pregnant and whatnot. Fortunately, these Lydians had a bunch of electrum, which is a naturally occurring gold-silver alloy. So they started making Electrum coins as it made trade with both empires much easier, since both the Greeks and the Persians would accept gold and silver. Over time the Lydians got pretty good at making these coins and the Greeks started copying their minting techniques, but with silver and bronze instead of gold because that's what they had on hand. The Persians liked the well-made gold coins too, so they also set up shop and started making some nice gold coins similar to the Lydian coins. But they soon found that to be too much work, so they just decided to conquer Lydia. Then the Greeks conquered the Persians. When you're marching soldiers across half the known world, it is useful to start paying them in coins 
that they can then use in any city anywhere they are able to conquer and force the local inhabitants of that city to accept payments and the coins the soldiers themselves were being paid in. Well, the Hellenistic Age was fun, but soon it was done and Rome was on the rise. Rome was a late bloomer to the currency game, and the early Republic did not use coins, but rather a system of bronze weights that were quite large and cumbersome because they were literally weights of bronze. That is, until the economic conditions of the Second Punic War forced the Romans to fully adopt a coinage system. The Second Punic War began when the Carthaginian general Hannibal invaded Italy in 218 BC. Hannibal ravaged Italy with impunity for 14 years, defeating every army Rome sent out to meet him. Every time Hannibal defeated a Roman army, the Romans responded by just raising another. And while the Romans seemed unable to find a general capable of defeating Hannibal in Italy, their other armies outside of Italy enjoyed great success against other Carthaginian commanders in Spain and Sicily. Just when Rome's economic situation bottomed out, Roman armies outside of Italy began capturing enormous amounts of coins that were used to replenish the empty treasury. So the Romans used their newfound wealth to launch an entirely new precious metal monetary system based on a denarius that would be struck in a good quality silver. The new coinage system was enormously successful and financed Rome's ongoing military efforts. The Second Punic War ended in October 202 BC when Scipio defeated Hannibal at the Battle of Zama. The ensuing peace treaty bankrupted Carthage and destroyed its military power forever, leaving Rome the master of the Mediterranean. The Roman denarius would go on to serve as the primary currency in Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia for the next 450 years. But where were the Roman coins made? Well, they were made in Rome, next to the temple of Luno Moneta. Moneta meaning unique or alone because Luno, later called Juno, was the Roman counterpart to the Greek god Hera. And Hera was the queen of the gods, and the protector and special counselor of the state. And since Romans saw Rome as a unique and alone state that needed to be protected against the world, Luno was thus Moneta, and Roman Moni was minted near the temple of Moneta. Anyways, coins were useful to pay soldiers in an ever-expanding empire, just like with the Persians and Greeks before, who would take those coins with them on campaign and force the new territories they had just conquered to use their new coins. Memes are mental genes, and over time money became a natural medium for memes. Roman coins effectively functioned as a vehicle to spread the imagery of Roman ideas across the world. The coins carried likenesses of emperors and famous imperial monuments which would be the nearest most Romans ever got to actually see of them. The populace often learned they were ruled by a new Roman emperor when coins appeared with the new emperor's portrait. Money as mass media. Marching armies money carried the news. Money carried the ruling class views. Money as a meme. Mass media memes through the medium of minted money meant mental militarization. Money, moneta alone, meant one found themselves somewhere in Rome. Fast forward a few hundred years and Rome found itself somewhat in decline. Coins were continuously minted as taxation only met 80% of the imperial budget and the shortfall was met by putting more coins into circulation. Money printer go burr. Or actually, money minter go burr? Since they did not possess the fancy money printers found in the Federal Reserve today and were still minting their money out of a limited supply of silver ore in order to maximize inflation at the expense of the middle class to line their own pockets via stock buybacks, the corrupt Roman officials had to do something that would give Janet Yellen a run for her money they debased their coins. Essentially, stretch the limited amount of metal as far as possible by reducing the silver content of coins and so increase the possible money supply. Nero reduced gold content in Roman coins by nearly 5% and silver and silver coins by 11%. Commodus, Septimus Severus, and Curricula all debased Roman coins causing even more inflation. Gradually, silver coins went from pure 100% silver to 50% silver and then on down until they reached an all-time low 
of just 2% silver content. Such blatant manipulation of currency did not go unnoticed by the population, who retaliated by paying their taxes using the newer shit coins and keeping the older ones with higher metal content stored under their mattresses. As the quantity of the Roman Empire increased, the quality of Roman leaders decreased, which caused the quality of the Roman Empire to fall, which caused the baseless Roman leaders to debase their currency to increase its quantity causing its quality to fall, which meant the standards were reduced and the ability to produce counterfeit coins was increased, which meant the quantity of counterfeit coins increased to the point that tax collectors were overwhelmed by the fake flood of coins. The flood of fake coins? So the silver currency collapsed and the Roman government began to collect its tax not in Roman coins but in goods themselves and then the Western Roman Empire itself collapsed. With the collapse of the Roman monetary system, trade also collapsed and for the powerful, wealth increasingly became measured not in coinage, but in the amount of that which produces goods, productive land. The more productive land one had, the more goods one had, the more warriors one could hire with said goods to take more productive land from one's neighbors, yielding more goods and soldiers and land. And so, for about 300 years, this anarchic game of Agario was played in the corpse of Rome as petty lords fought to expand their throne. Until one power rose above them all, when the Franks conquered most of Gaul. And who, you might ask, had the power to enforce this plan? Well, Pareto distribution be damned, Pepin was the man. But like all great and powerful men, Pepin perished, giving his son the throne. Now his son Charles Martel ruled the land, which he successfully campaigned to expand. But since one man cannot rule them all, the feudal system was officiated into law. Martel granted his warriors tracts of land to yield income and provide him with more fighting men, an oath of loyalty they would give in return for a fief upon which to live. Fief is pronounced fehu odd in Old Frankish, the basis of the word feudal. Land was already the best measurement of wealth since the fall of Rome, but under Martel the relationship between lord and vassal that defines feudalism legally was established. Martel's son continued to expand the empire and then his son, Charlemagne, Martel's grandson, succeeded in uniting the majority of Western and Central Europe. Charlemagne was the first recognized emperor to rule Western Europe after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Guess what he called his empire? Rome. And called himself King of the Romans. And like the Romans, he began issuing standardized coins which were called pennies, from Latin pondus, meaning weight. Remember those bronze weights? And from this we get US pennies and British pounds and Spanish pesos. The lords were vassals of the king, and kings were vassals of the king of kings, God, or rather, God's chosen representative, the Pope. At the very top of European feudal society was the Pope, and by the end of the 12th century, the papacy had more feudal vassals than any temporal ruler. This meant he could call upon more men and warriors than anyone, and this is just what Pope Urban II did on November 27, 1095, when he called all Christians in Europe to crusade against the Seljuk Turks. The first crusade was on the tail end of the Viking expansion, and after three centuries of fighting and converting the Northmen, Europe was packed full of war-forged nobles and converted Viking warriors, all with incredible military training and equipment. Interestingly, many once Vikings, now converted, became crusaders, the crusades basically being a giant well-organized Viking raid. These warriors had been paid in land per the feudal system, but the Holy Land itself was far away, and although some land was promised to the higher-ups, it was generally understood that payment in land was not viable, as the purpose of the Crusades was to reclaim the Holy Land for the papacy and to weaken Islam. So the papacy paid with coins. 
The warriors could transport their weapons and horses and other tools of war to the Holy Land, but they could not transport every single supply they would need on the long trip from Western Europe all the way to the other end of the Mediterranean. So paying these men in coins also solved practical supply issues as well as they could buy supplies once they landed in the Holy Land. But transporting large bags of precious coins is a dangerous thing even today and especially so in medieval Europe even for well-armed warriors, so the men heading off to crusade needed a way to safely and securely ship the large amounts of coin from their homes all the way to the Holy Land and back again. Enter the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were a group of warrior monks who had specialized in transporting pilgrims through hostile Muslim lands to the Holy Land before the crusades before the Turks had banned Christians from Jerusalem, and so they were especially well positioned to begin transporting other precious cargo besides people, for a fee. Knights would deposit their coins in one of the Templar's chapter houses located in any big city in Western Europe, London, Paris, etc., and the Knights would receive a receipt. Then, once the knight hit the ground in the Holy Land, he could produce the receipt and withdraw his coin from the Templar office in Jerusalem. Boom, international banking is born. Usury, or charging interest on a loan, is illegal in the Catholic Church even today. But the Templars and later banks got around this by charging late fees, which was not illegal. And if you paid back your loan on time, they didn't make money, so they would blacklist you from ever getting a loan again. And this was commonly understood. So basically, credit was built by paying late but still paying. Another way was to donate money to the Templars to thank them for giving you an interest-free loan. Soon the Templars accumulated huge amounts of wealth and started to make loans to church hierarchs, kings, and even popes. Even though the crusade itself failed miserably, the Templars themselves had become extremely rich and war profiteering is never a good look in any age. Despite this, the Templars' wealth allowed them to accumulate massive influence and power, with even the most powerful monarchs in Europe being deeply indebted to the order. Well, why repay your loans when you can just kill your lenders? Fortunately for the debtors, the Templars were a secretive order with many arcane and unusual rituals as well as a reputation for war profiteering that gave the bloodthirsty, debt-ridden rulers and church authorities plenty of ammunition to take them down publicly, thus wiping out their debts. So that's exactly what they did. On Friday, October 13th, 1307, King Philip IV of France, in league with Pope Clement V, ordered all Templars to be rounded up and thrown in prison where they were persecuted and executed. This was the end of the order and is also why Friday the 13th is considered unlucky. The Templars were gone, but there were more crusades to be had, and the money cat was out of the bag, so to speak. Loans are useful for building castles and besieging castles, and doing other noble stuff like marrying one's cousin, so the nobility still needed loans despite their kings killing off the biggest lenders in the land. And it just so happened that the crusades had given those backwards Europeans a taste of the high life. Crusaders in the east were amazed by the luxury goods the exotic spices, silks, and other commodities that were rare in Europe. Although the Crusades had failed, recall that the Crusaders themselves were largely paid in coins rather than land, so Europe generally saw an increase in currency combined with an increase in demand for goods, which could be gained through trade with the East. Fortunately, a few northern Italian city-states were well positioned to access these goods through trade with the Turks, namely Genoa and Venice both coastal cities, which meant they had ports, ships, and long-standing maritime traditions. The northern Italian states had traded with the Islamic world for centuries, but until the 13th century, they mostly traded through Byzantium, who, like the kingdom of Lydia before it, acted as a middleman marking up the prices of goods flowing through their domain. And like the kingdom of Lydia before, Byzantium was surrounded by enemies on all sides. Descended from Rome, Byzantium had always maintained a strong navy and military to counter these threats. But it was not the constant grind of warfare and geopolitical pressure that led to Byzantium's eventual martial decline. 
Rather, it was a great time of peace and complacency that resulted in neglect and the hollowing out of the imperial war machine. Throughout most of the 11th century, the Byzantine navy faced few challenges. Under Constantine IX, both the army and navy were reduced as military service was increasingly outsourced to foreign mercenaries. The large imperial fleets maintained since Rome slowly declined into small squadrons geared more towards the suppression of piracy than towards confronting a major maritime foe. By the end of the 11th century, the Byzantine navy was a shadow of its former self and to deal with emerging threats, the Byzantines increasingly outsourced their naval protection to the Venetians and other northern Italian city-states in return for trade concessions and extensions of privileges that practically rendered the Byzantines hostage to the Latins. Since the fall of Rome, the Byzantine Empire had maintained the Roman minting standards and minted the best coins, which were quite literally the gold standard of medieval Europe. Like Lydia before, high quality Byzantine coins were used by states in both the East and the West, until Byzantium, like Lydia before, was conquered by the states in both the East and West. The northern Italian city-states, now dominating trade with the Islamic world, began to create their own high-quality coins from gold gained from trade with Tunis, which eventually pushed out the diminished Byzantine coins as the gold standard in Europe. The Florentine florin and the Venetian ducat became the dominant forms of currency used across the Catholic world. This prosperity gave rise to a demographic explosion in northern Italy. The population doubled in the period between the 11th and 13th centuries, which led to the emergence of large cities. Newfound wealth saw the rebuilding of the great cathedrals and a substantial migration from the country to the city. During this time, the rate of urbanization reached 20%, making it the most urbanized society in the world. Otto of Freising, a German bishop who visited central Italy during the 12th century, commented that Italian towns had appeared to have exited from feudalism, with their society and economy based on merchants and commerce rather than warrior nobles tied to the land. It is estimated that the per capita income of northern Italy nearly tripled from the 11th to the 15th century. Trading with Muslims meant Italian merchants had to learn and use the number system the Islamic world used. The Europeans used Roman numerals as their mathematical language, but the Turks used Arabic numerals. Despite Roman numerals having a cool nostalgia in our society today, they are absolutely garbage to work with. It is nearly impossible to do mental math with Roman numerals. They are not entirely positional, there is no number zero, and they use letters as symbols instead of numbers. To calculate with Roman numerals, one had to use an abacus. But with the adoption of Arabic numerals, those numbers we're all familiar with today, it was easy to multiply and divide and do arithmetic in your head or on paper. Early Renaissance science and finance and architecture would have been impossible without this adoption and without the introduction of the concept of zero. All of this cognitive power came simply from adopting a new symbolic system. In fact, it was so revolutionary that when merchants returned to Italy and started doing mental math using alien symbols, it was nearly considered to be a sort of magic and worried the church who suspected it might be some sort of witchcraft. Anyways. As I mentioned earlier, the Templars had established what was basically the first international bank, but were killed off by the monarchs of Spain and France after becoming too influential. But there was still a large demand for loans. Northern Italy had gradually become the economic center of Europe, and off the back of massive mercantile success arose a set of family-owned banks including the Medici. These bankers started off by forwarding cash for prospective mercantile voyages funding trade and earning a return on investment, but they soon found themselves issuing loans to local businesses and nobles and church authorities and eventually even monarchs. The ability for the local population to borrow catalyzed the already rapid development. Charging interest on loans was still outlawed by the Catholic Church, so they employed the same tactics of charging fees for late payments and blacklisting anyone who paid on time or didn't provide a substantial enough donation to thank them for the loan. Throughout Europe, fairs were the greatest event in the economic life of a medieval town. 
Here, merchants from all over Europe gathered to buy or sell products. Different stalls were established with all kinds of things for sale, from spices and rugs to toothpaste and drugs. In these stalls, merchants would place their wares on benches to show off what they had to offer. Big ballad northern Italian bankers hit the European fair scene, and upon these benches they would set out their wares, their wares being bitch and piles of well-minted high-quality coins, ducats, and florins. These big booty bankers benches in Italian were pronounced banca. This is where we ultimately get the name bank from. Barley gave us bread and beer, bad decisions, babies, bronze, Babylon, and breakthroughs. Banks gave us the bourgeoisie, busybodies, books, buildings, bitch and barges, basic chemistry, big British, black gold, Carl Benz, big war, big boom, Bretton Wood, bin Laden. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. The Caravel. Developed in the 15th century by the Portuguese to explore along the West African coast and into the Atlantic Ocean, these new vessels used Latin cells, which allowed them to sell windward, or like kind of into the wind, but at an angle. Caravels were used by the Portuguese and Castilians for the oceanic exploration voyages during the Age of Discovery. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. By the mid-16th century, the quantity of cargo that a single boat could ship increased from a few hundred pounds to a few hundred tons. Seaside civilization super savvy at sailing could leverage these new technologies to gain a huge advantage over the competition. Before deepwater navigation, tyrannies of distance proved so consistently overwhelming that trade was exceedingly rare. Roads only existed within a culture, and within most cultures there wasn't a wide enough variety of goods to justify much trade in the first place. Places lucky enough to have navigable rivers were the exceptions, and as such tended to be the richest cultures. Items ripe for trading tended to be limited to the exotic, rare spices, gold, porcelain, etc. Transcontinental trade via routes like the Silk Road took the form of hundreds of middlemen and hundreds of different cultural and political entities laced along rough routes like a string of pearls, with each adding their own price hikes to the goods cost, thus generating 10,000% markups as a matter of course. This kept trade goods firmly in the categories of lightweight, low bulk, and non-perishable. Deepwater navigation sailed around the entire problem. The new ships could sail out of sight of land for months at a time, with cavernous holds limiting their need to stop for supplies. The lack of middlemen reduced the cost of luxury goods by an excess of 90%, and that was before the powers backing the new deep water traders started dispatching troops to directly take over the sources of the spices and silks and porcelain that the world found so valuable. The world's dominant political units rapidly evolved from sequestered agricultural communities to globe-spanning, trade-based deep-water empires projecting power to access new markets to ship more goods to trade higher value stuff to pay back the loans they took from the banks to finance the cost of building the ships and paying their sailors and soldiers in the first place. Between the new naval industries and the dizzying array of traded products, the empires needed hubs to develop and process and craft and distribute everything under the sun. This did more than give rise to the world's first megacities, where everyone was engaged in value-added labor. The resultant explosion in urbanization and skilled labor supplies accelerated the technological curve even more. Less than two centuries into its deep water era, London, a city as far away from the trade hubs of the Silk Road as is possible in Eurasia, became the world's largest, richest, and best educated city. Such a massive concentration of wealth and technical skills in one place quickly reached critical mass. All by themselves, the English generated sufficient new technologies to launch their own civilizational transformation. In the early industrial era, London, like most major early industrial cities, had grown beyond its ability to harvest timber for charcoal. Deforestation drove up the price of wood, improving the economics of the alternative, coal. More and more demand for coal resulted in deeper and deeper coal mines, which, Britain being an island and all, quickly punched below the water table. Muscling buckets of water to clear out the freaking water table didn't work for shit, so pumps were brought in. 
but muscling pump stations to pump out the freaking water table didn't work very well either, so steam engines came into being to address the problem. It worked for a bit, but the new steam engines required power, and that power came from burning coal, and that coal came from ever deeper shafts that filled with ever more water from the freaking water table, so miners didn't really solve their problem, but instead industrialized its scale. Faced with the cost of ever deeper shafts and ever more expensive steam engines, some suppliers ventured further afield to source coal from seams that were not directly adjacent to London. That fix required its own build-out, canals and boats to transport the black stuff back to merry old London. Soon half of Britain's private boats were used to move coal, generating its own inflationary price issue. The divine inspiration to increase their profit margin struck some enterprising coal suppliers who combined some newer, more powerful steam engines with the rails used for cart transport within the mines and a blessed machine was born. Mankind's shift from carriages to rail reduced the cost of internal transport by a factor of 8, allowing more transportation at economically sustainable prices of literally everything – people, food, coal, iron ore, soldiers, and all that other stuff required to build ships and cars and airplanes and rockets. In the US, the Transcontinental Railroad opened up the West. In Russia, the Trans-Siberian Railroad opened up the East. Burning coal to generate steam meant we could generate energy when and where we wanted to. Increasing the strength and precision of energy applications by two orders of magnitude redefined industries as broadly arrayed as mining and metallurgy, construction and medicine, education and warfare, manufacturing and agriculture, each generating its own technological suits, which in turn transformed the human experience. Advances in medicine didn't just improve health, they doubled lifespans. Concrete didn't just allow for real roads, it gave us high-rises. The development of dyes didn't just spawn a chemicals industry, it directly led to fertilizers that increased agricultural output by a factor of four. Steel is stronger, lighter, less brittle, and more corrosion resistant than iron. Steel provided every industry that used metal with a quantum leap in capacity, whether that industry is transport or manufacturing or war. Anything that made muscle power less necessary helped build a coffin for institutionalized slavery. Similarly, electricity didn't just expand worker productivity, it generated light, which manufactured time. In pushing back the night, people had more hours to read, expanding literacy to the masses. From the agricultural substrate grew civilizations networked through information-carrying currency. The emergence of banking institutions front-loaded the necessary capacity to drive the age of discovery, which yielded even more resource abundance, front-loading even more capacity. The Industrial Revolution began in 1750, birthing the age of the machine. The world was soon covered in engines raw power harnessed from steam. The technological revolution began in 1870, birthing the age of manufacturing. The world was soon covered in mills, all things made from steel. Mass production increased yields, growing Earth's carrying capacity exponentially. The digital revolution began in 1948, birthing the age of information. In less than a century, the world was covered in a wide web made of bits created from nimble human fingertips. All knowledge available through technology, hyperlinks connecting infinitely. The digital revolution gave rise to the age of information, infinite information accelerating innovation, accelerating innovation implementing global automation, global automation ushering in the age of imagination. In the information age, the main activities generating economic value are analysis and rationalization. In the age of imagination, the main activities generating economic value are idea generation and innovative creation. When all things are automated, all things are smart. The world covered in a web of inorganic intelligence, what value does the human hold? The dead material world begins to outperform the biological. Humans outperformed by machines and rational thinking, analyzing, calculating, even physically moving. Is mankind made obsolete? No. 
AI can't prompt itself. Biology emerging from the raw universe itself, humans alone can provide input, generate, and create. But where are the human concepts made? Well, information-carrying coins were once minted from silver near Moneta in Rome. But information-carrying concepts are minted from the information in human minds alone. We spent the first decade building platforms and getting them to scale. And if you want to think about it, again, back to sort of this poker analogy, others' mistakes minus your mistakes is the value. Well, the value that was captured was trillions of dollars, essentially to Apple and to Google. And they did that by basically um, attracting billions of monthly active users to their platform. Then this next wave were the apps. Facebook, QQ, Tencent, TikTok, Twitter, Snapchat, that whole panoply of, of apps. And interestingly, they were in many ways an atomized version of the platforms, mm -hmm. right? They sat on top of them. They were an ecosystem participant, but the value they created was the same. Trillions of dollars of enterprise value, billions of monthly active users. Mm -hmm. Well, there's an interesting phenomenon that's kind of hiding in plain sight, which is that the next most obvious atomic unit are content creators. Now, let me give you two examples. Lex Friedman, this random crazy guy, yeah. uh, Mr. Beast, mm -hmm. you know, Jimmy Donaldson, just the two of you alone, add, add it up, mm -hmm. okay? And you guys are going to approach in the next five years, a billion people. The only thing that you guys haven't figured out yet is how to capture trillions of dollars of value. Now, maybe you don't want to, and maybe that's not your well, state admission. Well, yeah, right, right. But let's well, just look at Mr. Beast alone because he is trying to do exactly that probably. Yeah, and I think Jimmy is going to build an enormous business. But if you take Jimmy and all of the other content creators, right, you guys are atomizing what the apps have done. You're providing your own curated news feeds. You're providing your own curated communities. You're allowed, you let people move in and out of these things in a very lightweight way and value is accruing to you. So the honest answer to your question is I would focus on the content creator side of things because I believe that's where the puck is going. That's a much more important shift in how we all consume information and content and are entertained. It's through brands like you, individual people that we can humanize and understand are the filter. So why should you become a YouTuber? Well, the age of imagination is upon us. ChatGBT forebodes. Human minds consume content and generate the basic input to run AI code. But who prompts human minds? Thanks for watching, and please subscribe.